So we're going to talk about exceptions. And uh, exceptions, they we have exceptions in all the programming languages. Exceptions is uh, an ambiguous way to tell the user, to tell the programmer that uh, something, something is wrong, that the call was finished tag successfully. And uh, in uh, some circumstances, like in uh, when we call uh, Unix program, for example, Unix shell, it uh, returns some code, some integer value. And uh, we can decide if integer value is zero, then uh, it's a successful code. If it's not zero, then something went wrong. But uh, actually, we don't know if if it's catastrophic failure or what, or, some, or just... Uh, just we have such output. So there is some ambiguity in when we talk about return codes. So uh, exception is uh, like returning value of a function or returning value of a method. But uh, when we, instead of normal return, we have this exceptional return, we know that something is wrong. So it's an additional returning value of function. We can reason about it in such way. So there are, basically uh, uh, three types of exceptions like uh, program bugs i think you already know about it when we just write write algorithm and this algorithm does something wrong like null pointer dereference so we're going to to get a value from array that's out of bounds and, and things like this so program bugs we should get rid of them uh, there might be invalid input or user's errors Something like uh, we ask user to enter an integer number and user just enters, I don't know, some characters, some uh, uh, name, for example. And it cannot be converted to, to integer number, so we have an exception caused by user error. And there are things that we also we cannot control. It's hardware and network. Uh, for example, we are trying to open file and the uh, disk is just not available or network is not available or we are out of memory. So these are hardware errors and uh, actually we cannot control it in, uh, using software. Ways. So oh, out of three types of exceptions, only one type, the program errors, uh, is actually uh, that we can control, that we can do something about, that we can fix. Others will inevitably happen over and over again. So we have to deal with exceptions. Uh, in Java, everything is class. So Java is object-oriented. And so exceptions are instances of uh, some classes. And we have quite a complex hierarchy of exception classes in Java. And what we need to understand that at the root of this hierarchy is throwable class. And so everything that can be thrown is throwable in, in Java. And uh, the throwable have uh, <clears throat> two subclasses, that is error and exception. And uh, exception has many subclasses, but one of, uh, of them is a sp very specific one, is runtime exception. So we have to understand the, these uh, four classes and how they are related. And... Uh, What's the meaning? Uh, error is uh, for system use only. It's about some, some catastrophic failures in Java virtual machine. So if, uh, if we call a method and it produces an error, an exception whose class is error, then we cannot just cannot do anything about it because something catastrophic uh, happened. It might be a bug in the JVM itself. It might be, I don't know, out of memory error or some system is corrupted. So we cannot do anything about it. Just our program failed <laughs> catastrophically. Another, uh, another subclass of throwable mm -hmm. is exception. An exception is... Uh, is an error that can be handled programmatically, that can be catched and handled. And uh, there are two subtypes, actually. Uh, if, we, uh, if the exception thrown is a subclass of runtime exception, Java will call them unchecked exceptions. If it's a subclass of exception itself, then it's checked exception. And I will explain you wh what it means in Java. Uh, so. Uh, actually, 
the initial maybe the initial idea of uh, creators of Java language was that uh, if uh, uh, for 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 unchecked runtime exceptions uh, they are generally should signal about software bugs. So if we have uh, unchecked exception in our program, we should try to fix it. And if we have checked exception, like I/O exception. IO exception is hardware exception. It's about, uh, I don't know, we are trying to read the file and the file is not there. So we should handle it. And uh, uh, it was an initial idea, but uh, something went wrong and I'll explain you later what, what went wrong. <clears throat> uh, uh, but uh, then let's, let's explain how it was, uh, I don't know, planned uh, in Java language. In Java, we have a capability of the language, a capability uh, about declaring exceptions, which are thrown, which can be thrown in method. So if we have, I don't know, in a constructor of some class, say file input stream, say name, and uh, this constructor has uh, this clause so when we declare constructor, we also declare that this constructor constructor might throw file not found exception. So we declare it. Like we declare uh, output type of function, we also can, in, in certain conditions, we must declare exceptions that might be thrown uh, in this method. Uh, so, uh, uh, we can declare one more than one exception. So if we this uh, this one uh, this method, for example, loads image and in can uh, throw more than one exception type, we can declare it using comma separation, and uh, we just we just say that this method might throw these two types of exceptions. And uh, uh, there are some peculiarities. And first of all, we don't need to declare exceptions that are inherited from runtime exception. So th these exceptions, these, these ones, there are many of them, and you can write your own exceptions. And uh, if you inherit them from runtime exceptions, they are called unchecked exceptions, and you just don't need to declare them. Uh, why it's done so? Because these exceptions that are unchecked exceptions, they, uh, they were planned, they were thought of as uh, uh, program errors. So generally, uh, there must be no such exceptions, right? We are not expecting them. If they happen, we should just uh, read the logs, we should debug, and we should get rid of them. Uh, for checked exceptions, it's just expected way of uh, system behavior. Like we are reading file and uh, it's hardware, we cannot do anything about it. We can just get some exceptional situation. So we should be able to handle it. That's what uh, the, uh, that was the original idea about checked and checked exceptions in Java. How can we throw an exception? Just uh, using throw operator. So we're creating exception as, a, as a, any other object, and then we call throw. And uh, what happens then? We're exiting method this method and we're exiting all the other methods until the exception is uh, catched, uh, until the exception is caught. Uh, or uh, if uh, no code is going to, caught, uh, to catch this exception, uh, the program will finish. Uh, what exceptions can be thrown and what can't be thrown? Uh, so we cannot, we should not explain, uh, also, we can explicitly throw any, any throwable uh, that's allowed by, by Java language specification. In practice, it's uh, prohibited to explicitly throw exception, runtime exception, throwable, and error. Because uh, uh, these classes are designed to be uh, base classes for some subclasses that uh, should describe your specific uh, your specific exceptions. So we should not explicitly throw this one, this and this and this. So these are just the base classes. This one we should never throw uh, for for another reason actually because uh, this is for Java Virtual Machine, 
it's a system of catastrophic failure. So uh, this one is expected only from uh, Java machine. Uh, but <coughs> this one is just uh, doesn't make sense. It's better for you to define your own subclass and uh, throw it. Uh, but what base class should we choose for our exception? So this is uh, the question actually. And uh, we have two alternatives. If we inherit uh, this our exception class from exception, then we should be ready to either declare it uh, in your methods, because Java won't compile uh, your method if it's uh, going to throw some uh, checked exception. Uh, just uh, maybe uh, maybe it's even better for me to to show you where is my where is my ID. Uh, say like if I'm going to throw IO exception here, IO exception here, new. Uh, see, it's uh, it's uh, unhandled. Like, what what options do I have with the checked exception? I'm either should add exception to method signature and say that this method now is going to throw this exception, or I should uh, handle it. I should handle it in try catch block, and I will explain you later what, what this means actually. So, uh, if I uh, put this line somewhere else. Say, uh, are we going to to call swap, for example? We're we going to uh, swap. I don't know. New int doesn't matter here. If we are going to throw this exception here, and I, I I'm not going to catch it right right now. Yes, I'm going to add it to method signature. See, uh, we have no error here. But now we have error here because uh, Java now understands that uh, this swap method can throw IO exception. And this exception should either be caught, either be handled or declared in this method. So now imagine that uh, we have some method deep, deep inside your code. And we have to, we want to throw an exception in this method. And we have two alternatives. Either we are going to, to throw a catch, uh, to, to throw a checked exception. In this case, we are going to write rows here and here and in every every each and every method that is going to, to call this uh, this code. Or we are going to uh, use unchecked exception. And uh, let me show, let me show you how it's going. If we are calling, I don't know, new illegal illegal state exception is an, an example of unchecked exception. So what do we have now? Now uh, ID says that uh, this, uh, this is never thrown actually. So this is an unnecessary declaration. So this can't be removed. This one also can't be removed, can't be removed, right? So uh, now we, we, we are not bothering with uh, uh, declarations, but still exception is here. And we may forget about handling it. So uh, you, you see the point, right? If we are using checked exceptions that Java will, will prohibit us to compile the code without uh, proper handling of this exception. If we are using unchecked exceptions, then we'll will not change the code, will uh, bother less with uh, these declarations, but we might forget to handle it. And uh, there is more, more to that, actually, uh, because as uh, Java language evolved and uh, some functional programming um, capabilities appeared in Java language, and uh, we uh, they appeared lambdas and streams. We are going to discuss lambdas and streams later. And uh, lambdas are not um, very compatible with the concept of checked exceptions, actually. So uh, in, in the age of lambdas and streams, checked exceptions are rather an unneeded headache. So uh, many people argue about if checked exception was a 
good feature in Java language. Uh, checked exception is quite a unique feature to Java language. You won't uh, uh, find checked exceptions in other languages, say in Kotlin, they just got rid of checked exceptions. So all, all the exceptions are unchecked. Uh, some people still argue that uh, this, uh, this feature makes uh, Java code more safe, uh, more type safe, because compiler finds uh, more, more user errors. And uh, so uh, people, people still arguing about it. So it's a quite complicated uh, question, which type of exception to, to choose. I'd suggest uh, using checked exceptions uh, when you can. Uh, still, you can do it with, uh, when your code is properly designed. Thus, you will be able to, to get uh, more from Java compiler in terms of uh, finding errors in your code. So uh, how to catch an exception? Uh, it's uh, more or less the same in uh, every programming language. We have the try catch block. So if we have code that might throw some exception somewhere, uh, we have this catch block. And uh, if exception is thrown, say, in this line, then we, we won't execute this, this line. We'll just, uh, uh, we'll just jump into this catch block. And if uh, the exception type is uh, like this, if E is uh, exception type or subtype of exception type, then uh, uh, we can execute this catch block. And in this catch block, E will be declared. So we can just read some information from this E variable. We actually, um, for our like first course of programming, uh, we had this uh, try catch block. Uh, mm -hmm. We were doing some tasks like, uh, you have text uh, text file check if there is something and if it and there is like some characters please change them otherwise and uh, our teacher told us like you you can use either or else if in this, uh -huh. or uh, you can use like try exception and uh, we we didn't discuss it we just know so if you want to uh, avoid error you just uh, put the try catch block <laughs> and think... everything works it's cool. Actually, it's cool because, yeah, it's quite maybe complicated concept, this uh, try catch. I'm going to discuss it deeper. So uh, it, it's okay. it's great that you actually have an idea about it. So, yeah, th uh, thanks for, uh, for updating. Uh, in Java, you can catch uh, several types of exception, exceptions in one try block. For example, uh, uh, if we have... Uh, this hierarchy of exceptions it's it's actual hierarchy of exceptions so we have io exception and uh, two subclasses file not found exception and an un unknown post exception uh, we can write our code like this so we can uh, just uh, put try write some code and we can handle uh, handle these exceptions and uh, what matters here is order of these catch blocks so how Java is going to handle our exception? Uh, uh, let's assume uh, uh, something thrown an exception. And it's going, going to, to go through these three cache blocks and see if E is file not found exception, then we are going to, to, to just jump here. If it's not, we see if it's unknown host exception and we can jump here. And this, uh, this code won't be executed and this one also. If it's not, uh, either find not found exception, if it's IO exception, then we jump here. What do you think? What's going to happen if I move this catch block here, as move it upwards to make it first block? What do you think is going to, to happen? Your ideas. As, so as you said that uh, if uh, like there are code inside of block and uh, it could catch exception so i think uh, if uh, like the first one we see file not found exception so if the first is found file not found exception that it is executed uh, just until that line but if io exception is found that it is not executed in like some next line and if we change their positions we will change the some border until the code will be executed uh, until it's found exception 
Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Thanks for the answer. And I see that uh, uh, maybe I should uh, uh, should have explained uh, it, it better. Uh, you see, only one of these uh, three blocks actually is going to, to be executed. If it's written this way, only one. So uh, uh, if uh, file not found exception is actually thrown, then only this block is going to be executed. Even though uh, file not found exception is IO exception, right? Because it's a subclass, we can, uh, we can say that file not found exception is IO exception. So it's actually instance of IO exception in a way. It's uh, type compatible, but uh, uh, Java is going to check uh, catch blocks one after another. So if it, uh, it, it, it says, oh, it's file not found exception. Good, great. I'm going to execute this, this catch block and I'm not going to, to check and execute all the other catch blocks. If it's, I don't know, a non haunts exception, then uh, Java says, oh, it's not file not found exception. Hmm. Uh, let, uh, let them check this. Okay, it's a known host exception. I'm going to execute this one. And if for some reason it's, uh, um, I don't know, end of file exception, it's also uh, your exception is, is also a subtype of IO exception. It checked this, it's not, not, not this one, not this one. Okay, it's IO exception. It's either IO exception itself or some, some subclass of it then it's going to execute this code. So my question is, if I'm going to, what do you think? If I'm going to move uh, this block upwards and make it the first one, and we have, uh, say, file not found exception. I, I think th th those unknown host and file not found will be never executed because IO exception is kind of like now, ancest now you're ancestor. Correct. Now ancestor. you're absolutely correct. Yes, 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 yes. It's ancestor. Yes, right. It's a super class. So they are not going to be executed, never going to be executed. Uh, so it's a correct, correct answer as far <laughs> as you know, Java, <laughs> but it's not <laughs> absolutely correct because uh, it, it, not only it won't be executed, the code won't compile because Java compiler will uh, analyze this, uh, Catch block. It will analyze the sketch block and it will tell you, hmm, you wrote your catch blocks in such a way that only one of uh, these three blocks will ever be executed. If we if we find some exception to be IO exception, this one has sub subclasses, so we it just doesn't make sense uh, for this code to be here. So maybe you made a mistake. So I won't compile your code. So it's even more than, more than that. As I told you before, as I told you many times, Java tries to uh, find as many bugs in your code as possible in compile time before your program is even run. So it's uh, <clears throat> main, maybe main principle feature of Java. So you, you said that like Java <laughs> finds a lot, of, a lot of a lot of mistakes for us and it has that garbage collector, but mm -hmm. how it is about efficiency. So uh, when you have like big, big project and you just like, you turn down it for like for a night. I, I know like some projects, uh, like my friends told me and they like turn it in the morning and like it will take so much time for it to just like run because uh, it, there are a lot of features of language that are just like as it compiler. It sounds like an artificial intelligence that know a lot of how to avoid mistakes and how to collect some uh, garbage. So this is kind of very um, hard to to like keep a border between efficiency and the uh, correctness of your. Uh, uh, yes, you you are correct, uh, and there are actually two aspects that we must talk about. First aspect is about efficiency of running code, and uh, another aspect is uh, the length of co compiling. Is the time uh, that uh, we. Um, um, have to wait when our program compiles. Actually, first one is not that uh, important, right? We can wait for some time uh, for the program to compile, but as soon as it compile, uh, compiled, we just uh, uh, push it to production and uh, now it works. And uh, uh, when I'm talking about, uh, when I'm talking about like uh, catching this, ty this type of errors, like, 
uh, here we are, uh, sorry. Right? Now it won't compile. I just, uh, I just shown you the, in practice that uh, the code is, uh, won't compile when I just uh, move around the sketch clauses. This is actually uh, something that uh, can be eliminated in compile time. So when the program is compiled, we'll just uh, won't have issues like this one. And uh, it will, it won't affect, uh, uh, it won't affect performance of your running code actually. And uh, uh, when speaking about compile time, Java is not the worst case actually, uh, because when we talk about Kotlin and especially about Scala, these uh, languages have uh, uh, more sophisticated uh, uh, type check uh, facilities. And uh, especially Scala is uh, well known about uh, just, you need just hours to compile some lengthy, lengthy project. Uh, and Kotlin also is uh, a bit uh, slower than Java when we talk about compile time, compilation time. When we talk about performance, it's completely another story. Uh, yes, garbage collector, as I told you before, garbage collector introduces some legs. It introduces uh, stop the world pauses. So uh, it won't uh, run as fast as, I don't know, some native code compiled from C. But uh, as I told you on the very first lecture, uh, because of dynamic uh, nature of Java language, because of just-in-type compiling, uh, there are many cases where Java programs act runs run actually faster than <laughs> compiled uh, than C programs compiled to native code. It's uh, complicated stuff, actually. We cannot uh, just judge, oh, this language is slow, this language is fast. There are many aspects, you compile time, run time, under which load do we get the most productivity, most performance on the side? Uh, so there are many use cases. So it's just a naive approach to tell that, oh, Java is slow and I don't know, C is fast. I can uh, show you examples where Java is faster than C and I can show you examples where C is faster than Java. And besides compile time and runtime, there is a start time. How, how, uh, how much time do we need to wait before a uh, program is started and warmed up and uh, fully functional? It's very important, also very important. And Java start startup time is not very good. Yes, it's true. We have generally we have to wait before everything spins up in Java virtual machine. Unlike I don't know JavaScript, but in Java we have <laughs> just uh, just features that uh, JavaScript doesn't have. So it's always about choice, best choice about uh, certain use cases. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, let's move on. And uh, besides, besides uh, this syntax, we also have this uh, very specific uh, syntax about the try multi catch called try multi catch. We can just use a vertical line to separate several uh, several uh, classes that we want to catch, and uh, uh, it will work. And uh, what will be actually type of E here? It's going to be a type of most specific common super type of uh, these exceptions. So uh, it's done uh, so that we can, uh, let me, let me. Uh, so uh, uh, this is lots of code actually, and we are going to, to use uh, only one catch block so we can do it like this. Of course, if I put it like this, it won't make sense because IO exception is a super class of uh, file not found exception, unknown host exception, and Java already telling me this. So it tells me, oh, please, please uh, remove, please remove this because you are going to catch them anyway. Uh, all right. <clears throat> uh, sometimes, Sometimes we want to rethrow uh, the exception with, that we all, uh, already caught at some point. So uh, say, for example, we have uh, a method that, uh, that's declared that it can throw a SQL exception. And we have uh, some code database access uh, code here that can, uh, can throw SQL exception at some point. And uh, we 
we uh, were writing catch block. And in this catch block, we are casting the SQL exception to exception. Exception is a super class. And uh, for, for some reason, we just want to log it, write it to logger and, uh, and rethrow it. We, we don't uh, want to suppress this exception. We want to rethrow it so that method will still uh, finish abnormally. Right, but uh, see what we have here. Also, E in this place of code has a, a type of exception, which is super class of SQL exception. And SQL exception is declared in this method. Java compiler is smart enough, enough to understand that this E at this point can only be SQL exception type. So this is another smart feature of uh, Java compiler. And you may, uh, I don't know, meet uh, some uh, test uh, questions or maybe questions at uh, job interviews about it. Uh, so you, exceptions can be rethrown. Actually, it's uh, normal practice. Another practice is to rope exception into other, another exception type. Say, uh, we have some method that can throw servlet exception. Uh, so this is just declared method. Maybe it's declared in some uh, super type. So we're overriding it. So we uh, cannot add uh, another throws uh, declaration to this method. We can only throw servlet exception in this method by, uh, by design, by contract. Uh, so uh, what if uh, we have code that uh, throws another type of uh, checked exception, say SQL exception. In this case, we can handle it uh, like this. We can catch a SQL exception and we can create new servlet exception, which ropes, just ropes the original one. And it's, uh, it can be done using init cause method. Each uh, throwable has this init cause method. And this method allows us to, to, to rop any exception into any other exception just to make it and uh, then we can throw it and it's uh, it's making it uh, compatible with your method declaration like we declared throw servlet exception and yes we will throw servlet exception but this uh, servlet exception is going to be wrapper around the original uh, sql exception also very very good practice and you are going to uh, use it uh, quite often uh, what about uh, method overriding? As I told you on previous lecture, uh, when we override methods uh, in classes, we should uh, keep uh, we should keep uh, parameters list of parameters the same, and uh, the name of uh, of the method must be the same, and list of parameters might be must be the same, and uh, return type must be covariant. That is, if uh, if uh, this foo returns number, uh, if we want to override this method. Uh, this one uh, must return either number or some subclass of numbers, say integer or double. Uh, and the same is uh, um, the same is correct about exceptions that uh, might be thrown in this method. If uh, we declare this one as foo throws foo exception, so overridden method might throw bar exception if and only if it's a subtype of foo exception then it will be correct uh, overriding of method. I think it makes sense for you uh, uh, because if we have, uh, if we cast it bar to full, then from our point of view, uh, this method might throw full exception. Okay, actually it throws bar exception, but bar exception is full exception because it's a subclass, so it's okay. Uh, there, are, uh, there is a number of uh, standard reusable types of unchecked exception in a standard library, and you can uh, utilize them. And uh, they are described in a great uh, effective Java book uh, that I recommend to everyone. And uh, <clears throat> you, you might just take note of them. Invalid argument exception. If something, uh, something is passed to your method that you just don't accept, expect, you may throw this one. Invalid state exception, it's just about uh, when something wrong is in, in your internal state. It's often uh, invalid state exception, uh, by the way, is just uh, often used as a default uh, <laughs> type uh, of exception. If something should be thrown and you don't know what uh, to throw, you often use invalid state exception. Null pointer exception, this one, 
also, all, uh, always used when we get null in place when where we don't accept expect null and index out of bounds exception when we get some index and we just cannot uh, uh, get element at it, this index because it's either less than zero or it's uh, great bigger than the maximum value of, uh, of elements that we have. And uh, when writing Java code, you are just a novice uh, Java developers and uh, you quite often you will be tempted to, to do this stuff. Like uh, we have uh, this, uh, let's, let's throw it here. Let's uh, throw IO, IO exception here. It, uh, it doesn't matter. We just need to have a method that throws this, throws this. Oh, actually we don't even have to throw it. We just uh, declare the methods in such a way that it can throw such uh, exception. And we, we call it, and uh, imagine this is a library method. We just cannot uh, go here and remove this one. So we should just do something about it. And you just cannot understand what can be done. And it's tempted to do uh, this. It's what uh, IDE propose you to do, actually. It's, uh, see, it's written automatically. It's, uh, we just... Uh, pushed alt enter, IDE wrote this code for us, and we're happy, program compiles. But I actually warn you against doing this. I'll explain you. Uh, <clears throat> if you are doing this, you're just, uh, I don't know, it's like hiding the problem. Uh, another, another example, uh, let's, uh, it's our, method so we should just we can just remove and it will work uh, say uh, thread dot sleep one second so we need our program to sleep for one second and we have this uh, interrupted exception and uh, until very end of our course when i'll be talking about concurrency you don't know what what interrupted exception is and what to do with it and you think, hmm, I just need this uh, one, one second sleep here in my code. And I don't want to just, just I need this, my scope. Let's, let's do it this way, like surround with try catch and it's okay. So <laughs> please don't do this. Uh, why? Because as I told you, you are hiding, you are hiding original, uh, uh, original problem here. Because if uh, in your production code, something, uh, something minimal, meaningful happens here, some real exception, some real problem, uh, you are not even going to see it because uh, yes, of course, uh, it will appear on the log. This, this exception will appear on the log, but then your program will just continue working with uh, broken state broken internal state and it's worst uh, sort of bugs because it's quite quite hard to debug and it uh, makes your code dirty so actually if you don't understand what to do with exception use uh, this simple algorithm you can refer to this slide <laughs> later in your career uh, first uh, you always can uh, check for, for this one. Can I just uh, add exception to method signature? In many cases, this will work for you. You just add this, uh, this exception to method signature. See, main, uh, main method can have as many exceptions uh, on its signature as you wish. Because if we have exception in main, uncode exception in main method, then it's going to be caught by some system handler. It will be locked uh, and your program will finish. Uh, and uh, say here we also just uh, throw, I don't know, IO exception and uh, uh, we just uh, add more here like this. So it must be your default method of handling exceptions. Just declare them. Uh, sometimes you, you just can't 
because uh, maybe you are overriding, maybe you are overriding some uh, method in, uh, sorry, where is my main method? It's here. Uh, maybe uh, you are overriding some method from base class and this base class came to you from a framework. And in this framework, you have, uh, I don't know, some strict, uh, some uh, strict contract that uh, this method should uh, uh, throw this type of checked exception and no other types. And uh, say, are you exception? And here we have uh, just another type of exception. I don't know, some file not found exception. And uh, here we have some another, another type of exception, say, servlet exception, whatever. Uh, we can uh, do like this. We can uh rope it using init closer constructor argument so do uh, the thing that's uh, uh that's shown here like you are catching it you are roping it and you are throwing it but now you are throwing it with a type that's already declared in in your method if you cannot change contract of your method uh, so there is long box sneaky throws, but I'll, I won't tell about it uh, because I think it's bad practice. <laughs> so actually uh, you can uh, either declare it or if you cannot uh, change method signature, uh, in many cases you can, you should drop it uh, to, to the exception that's already declared or drop it to unchecked exception. For example, invalid state exception. In this case, you uh, won't need to, to declare to declare a checked exception in your method signature. So these are actually two methods that you should use when you when you see some exception and uh, uh, Java compiler don't let you compile your code because you are not handling some checked exceptions. Okay, and the general rule, please please remember this because it's general rule and it concerns. Each uh, language, it concerns uh, just uh, design of your code. The general rule about handling exception is uh, throw early catch late. Please try to remember this. Please uh, try to understand what does this mean? Throw early catch late. What does this mean actually? First, the first part of it is throw early. It means that as soon as you understand in your code that something went wrong, you should throw an exception. If, for example, you have uh, some method and this method accepts, I don't know, some argument. And this argument must be an integer that is greater than zero. If uh, it's zero or below zero, you know that your uh, algorithm is not going to work because it's a restriction on your algorithm. Each algorithm works on a certain just subset of uh, input value. So you see that this input value is less than zero. Your algorithm is not going to work. Let's not wait until bug in the algorithm itself. Let's check it and throw illegal argument exception. And it will be much easier to debug later. If somebody by mistake called your method with the negative argument and uh, they get this exception, uh, value is negative, we're expecting positive value here. Oh, just uh, your user of your code will, oh, I just forgot I should use positive value. Okay, I'll check it. But imagine you didn't uh, throw early. You just let this algorithm work and this algorithm will return some gibberish, some just meaning, meaningless uh, result, maybe some wrong result, or maybe some value exception that you just don't know about just index out of bounds or I don't know, null pointer the reference. And uh, the user of your code, they won't understand what's happening. Maybe there is a bug in algorithm itself. So maybe it should be debugged in the algorithm. So they should look into algorithm and it will take much more time. So please throw early. As soon as you understand that it's not going to work with this internal state, you must throw exception in your code. What do we mean by catch late? What do we mean by catch late? This means that this catch close must be located as uh, far, or I don't know, as far in stack, uh, stack uh, in call stack as possible, as close to main uh, method as possible, actually. Uh, we shouldn't handle an exception 
until it's clear how exactly we should handle exception. Uh, imagine you are writing some library, a library that performs some calculation, for example. You just, I don't know, make machine learning library or some library that makes predictions or calculates something. You don't know all, uh, all the context of uh, executing it. If this library is executed in a desktop application, then exception must be shown to, to the user in this uh, alert uh, box and alert window, like we used to in uh, desktop applications. If it's uh, going to run in a web application, then it uh, certainly should be locked somewhere. Where should it be locked? Maybe to standard output. Maybe if your application runs in cloud, it should be locked to some log collector. We don't know about it. We're just writing, uh, I don't know, mathematical library. We should not think about it. Or maybe it should be shown to user. So uh, <laughs> conclusion is we should not bother about uh, catching exceptions if we don't know how it's going to be handled. Uh, your main method will most certainly know how to handle the exception because your main method will know that uh, your uh, program is a console program or it's a desktop program or it's a web program running in this or that environment. So don't handle exceptions. Just rethrow them. Just drop them in, in other exceptions. Just declare them. But <laughs> please try to uh, to make them just float up and up up to to main method. So this is a general rule. Please please remember it. It's very important for you for for your code design. Throw early, catch late. Okay. Uh, finally, block. We also have this finally block in try catch uh, statement, and uh, it works uh, in a way that it's always executed, always executed, no exceptions. <laughs> so if we, uh, for example, we have some, uh, some code here that might throw exceptions. And uh, even at some point, we are going to return the method itself. Uh, finally, block will work in any case. So if we have exception here, we'll uh, get this, uh, we'll jump into this exception handling block. And before, before we leave this try block, uh, we're always executing this. We're always executing it finally block. If uh, we are using return statement, return statement is going to return uh, the method itself. But you cannot, one cannot uh, escape uh, try finally block without executing finally. Even when you call return, finally, uh, will be executed before before return. So finally, is the block that's executed always, no matter which exception we have or return, or we just normally finish the execution. Why do we need finally block? As you can see, to close to to free up some resources in your code. If we uh, if we open the input stream file input stream, we acquired some system resources from uh, operating system. If we are not going to close, if we are not going to free these resources, uh, then uh, some errors might appear. For example, uh, if we are going to open too, too many files, the system will tell us, will just prohibit, that from, from, prohibit us to open just more files than it's allowed. It says you open too, too many files. Or if you're, opened and blocked some file and you uh, didn't close this file, other process or even your own program won't be able to write to this file because it's locked and uh, a, uh, the input stream is not uh, closed properly. So uh, this finally block uh, is usually uh, used for closing, for closing some resources. But uh, nowadays, nowadays, finally, block uh, used uh, quite rare because uh, starting from Java 7, version 7, if I'm not mistaken, we have a much uh, more convenient way to close, to close resources. Uh, we have uh, a problem with finally block is uh, if we have uh, two resources, for example, if we are opening uh, two, two files, we have to have uh, nested try finally blocks. 
See, we cannot uh, just close uh, out and in files in one finally block because uh, when we close out, an exception might occur and thus we won't close in. But if we want to make sure that we close everything, we must use nested, uh, nested finally blocks. And uh, uh, this is a dirty code. This, uh, this is uh, quite, quite a lot of stuff. So uh, starting from Java 7, uh, we can use uh, so-called try with resources. And try with resources looks like this. We just uh, uh, print try. We have uh, in round braces, re uh, we declare some resource. And uh, we don't write any, any finally block because a close method on this resource will be called automatically. And in order for this to work, uh, this must implement auto-closable interface. Uh, so it's uh, an, an example with multiple resources when we have uh, just uh, reading, reading some file with words, and we are going to write something to some other file. We just declared two resources using semicolon here. And uh, this one is, is doing what? It's uh, just uh, reading, reading this file just converting all the words to uppercase. And uh, it's uh, just uh, going to, to write uh, these words converted to uppercase to, to some output file. And uh, this is a correct code because after execution, normal execution or abnormal execution or some error, uh, both in and out will be closed. So please use try with resources when you are working with files or you are working with some auto-closable objects that must be closed after usage. And uh, yes, here are closable and auto-closable uh, interfaces. These are um, standard library interfaces. And uh, uh, one is a sub-interface of another. And we, we have this type covariance here. So auto-closable throw, throws exception. And uh, just closable throws IO exception, more specific type of exception. <laughs> Uh, but both can be used in try with resources block. And uh, the final thing that uh, I would uh, want to tell you about exception is that they are, of course, for exceptional cases only. Uh, you might be tempted to use exceptions as a means for control your program execution flow, because exception is just uh, a thing that can break every cycle that can just jump out of uh, many methods. And uh, so why not use it for, con for controlling program flow? Just don't do it because uh, they are not meant to, to be used like this. If, uh, so this, this is example of horrible code, like uh, we are just uh, doing what? We, are, we have uh, this range, uh, range array, and we're just using climb until array index out of bounds exception happens. So uh, we might write such a code, but it's actually horrible performance wise. I'll explain you just now. You, instead of this horrible code, we can write just this beautiful code because we have a for loop that can iterate through every element of array and uh, uh, it will finish as soon as uh, uh, range finishes. So we, we won't have a range index out of bound exception. So, yeah. so you want to say that uh, these two uh, examples of code do the same thing? Yeah, actually they do the wow. same thing. This code, yes. Uh, what do they do? They just call climb method on every mounting in a range. In a range. But, but that can look much more smooth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Not only this, not only it works, uh, it looks much cooler and more beautiful, uh, it works much faster. Why? Because uh, when, uh, when we expect some exception and it's thrown, it's thrown, exception is for exceptional case. Exception is, uh, uh, is an object which is hard to create. It, uh, uh, exception in itself uh, keeps uh, information about the place in the code where, where it occurred so that we can debug. So exception has debug information attached to it. 
But here we don't need debug information. We are not using this exception for, I don't know, debugging our code. We are using it for just for controlling flow of our code. And uh, uh, JIT will, will never optimize this code because uh, JIT is uh, written in such a way that it's not going to handle exception as something normal. As I told you, Java uh, just-in-time compiler, it uh, profiles your bytecode being executed and it says, okay, this, uh, this uh, just fragment of code is being run often. It's being run in such uh, preconditions. So we have uh, variables set to this and this. Uh, so uh, it can make shortcuts. It can just write uh, some specific, uh, produce some specific machine code that will, will be lightning fast. But a JIT compiler will never optimize for, for exceptions because it's written in such a way, because exception is uh, exception, something exceptional. It's not going to happen uh, often, and it will never expect that it will happen often. So this code will, uh, will work uh, slower, actually. It's not only it uh, looks ugly, it works slower. The same for, uh, uh, the same for this example. This says, uh, uh, actually, it's the same way using iterator, uh, parameterized iterator here. I will uh, tell you everything about parameterized classes in Java in the next uh, lesson. Uh, uh, but here we also expect exception at some point and we are going to catch and do nothing. And so we are using exception for, uh, for controlling flow. And uh, so this, you should never write code like this. Don't even try. You can use uh, this one. It's uh, just for another for for loop. Maybe it's not it's not that compact as this one, but still it uh, it does the same thing, and uh, it will be more performant. So the main conclusion, the main takeaway: never use exceptions for uh, controlling the flow. Never use exceptions for flow control. It's anti-part and it's something that you just shouldn't do. Yes, and here, here's some rationality for this. Yes, uh, because it masks the real errors and makes the code difficult to support because exceptions are errors anyway. Uh, it's resource consuming and uh, it's a slow. It's uh, going to be slow. Okay, uh, what, what if uh, your program is uh, just runs in production, you uh, already delivered it to your users? And at some point, something, some error just occurred. And uh, it will occur because there are no programs without bugs. <laughs> Each program has bugs. And uh, uh, what to do about it? You, most likely you will get something like this. This is uh, called the stack trace. You will see it uh, many times during your Java developer career. <laughs> it's uh, called stack trace. It's uh, uh, the log uh, information about some exception that happened. And this stack trace actually contains, contains uh, very valuable information, which can be used to debug this exception. What should you do with this? I just, I'm just going to show you. You, are, you should copy this to control C or whatever, uh, to buffer. Go to IntelliJ IDEA, go to analyze menu, analyze stack trace, and uh, just insert it to this window. And maybe I should just uh, show it here. It's not maybe uh, analyze stack trace. Okay, analyze stack trace or trend dump. So if we have actual stack trace, you can put it in this uh, window, uh, press okay. And afterwards, you will uh, be able to navigate through your code using uh, information about lines of, of code here in stack trace. What uh, does this stack trace mean? It means that at some point, uh, some answer controller called add answer, and this add answer called uh, set answer, and in method set answer at line 37, we had this uh, null pointer dereference. So sometimes it's not enough to just know the, at which point exception occurred. It, we must know which, methods, uh, which method called it. So maybe uh, uh, some erroneous, uh, uh, erroneous uh, data came from 
another from the calling method. So we have this stack trace and we have this analyze stack trace uh, feature in IntelliJ IDEA that we must use uh, to just uh, see through this uh, stack trace and debug the program, uh, the problem. So please use, uh, use this feature in IntelliJ IDEA. Okay, so this is all about, uh, about exceptions and before, before we'll have a short break, uh, let me just switch to, to, to another topic. And uh, so far we discussed uh, language syntax, Java language syntax, like we studied uh, classes, how to declare classes, how to declare enums, how to declare arrays, how to override methods. Uh, exceptions also have uh, some support in Java syntax, right? Try, throw, catch, try with resources. So all this was about uh, uh, Java syntax. But when, when we are uh, studying some language, we should not only study its syntax, we should study also libraries and standard libraries of the language. And uh, it is uh, maybe the bigger part of the language is standard libraries. So just one example, and this is an example from, from the great uh, effective Java book. Uh, sometimes you just need something <laughs> and you can either use a standard library or be tempted to write it yourself. Remember on our previous class, we tried to write an example of code that uh, calculates power, power function. Right? And then we just uh, looked at the actual uh, power of function code in standard library and saw how complicated it is. And uh, yes, you have to know standard library because it was wrote by experts and uh, it's uh, maybe way, way more complicated than you think about the problem. And it's usually in Java, at least, it's uh, of high quality and it's uh, being debugged and it's uh, have of high performance. And moreover, standard library evolves from version to version. And as it evol evolves from version to version, you must, uh, uh, you must know what new facilities are there in each new version and uh, utilize them. An example from this effective Java uh, book. If you want to produce random number in Java, uh, uh, in, uh, in previous versions of Java, there was only this uh, random class uh, that you can use, you can utilize, and uh, there was an anti-pattern of using it, like uh, creating new random uh, uh, a new random object and just getting one uh, one random value from it. If we are calling this new random often, uh, then so-called seed value is going to be calculated each uh, invocation. It is slow. It, it will not uh, give us a good uh, random distribution. So uh, it, actually this is uh, not a correct way to use random class. Uh, uh, before, before Java 7, we can use uh, just random and static initializer and then uh, reusing it in our code uh, in this way. Just we have single, a single uh, instance of random and we can reuse it by getting next double value, for example. Uh, starting from Java 7, there appeared another, another class called thread local random, uh, which can be used in this way. We're just using static current uh, current method, and this current method guarantees us to to return a random uh, random object that will be single for for the current thread of execution. So it's a thread safe. What's thread safe? I'll explain you much much later towards the end of our course. But uh, it will return us a thread safe object that we can utilize everywhere. So if we just needed a random double, we, we could use this one. And this looks uh, much simpler than this. And not only this, it's uh, uh, nearly four times faster and statistically better because thread local random is a newer version of random number generator in Java. But and, and uh, George Bloch is writing in, in his book. It's an example of how uh, standard library evolves. 
<laughs> but uh, his book uh, is uh, from uh, 2019, the latest edition, maybe. And uh, this autumn, we have Java 17, a new, new version of Java. And there is another way of uh, getting random number generators in uh, Java 17. And there is whole uh, whole new, uh, uh, whole new JEP. JEP is uh, Java, what E stands for, I don't quite, extension proposal. J is for Java, P is for proposal. Uh, <laughs> I just forgot what, uh, what E stands for. Uh, doesn't matter. It's a, a whole new specification about random number, number, random number generators in Java, so we can have a fast, uh, a, a whole family of fast and uh, quality random, random number generators in Java. So the new way of getting default generator is uh, uh, not only using thread local random, but uh, also you can use a random generator get default, and you will get better random number generator. What why I'm telling you uh, this, because if, for example, you studied Java, say, 10 years ago, and uh, or maybe 15 years ago, and you knew about this random uh, class, and this random class will be preserved in uh, Java library for, for the sake of backwards compatibility, and you, you are still using random uh, <laughs> the old uh, random number generator. You are just writing slower, less performant, and less quality code because in modern Java libraries, you have just better options for, for do this. So you just uh, uh, learn uh, <laughs> uh, with new version, with, with each new version of Java, you just, uh, you have to learn what, uh, what new facilities uh, the library has. And uh, you also must understand which uh, classes are actually outdated in the library, because there are classes like vector, date, file, string buffer, random, and others uh, that you must not use in your new code. They are uh, in standard library only for the sake of backwards compatibility, uh, so that some old code will work, but your new code, in your new code, you should not use these classes. And uh, you, you must understand this. Not every class in standard library should be used in new code. There are some classes that are there only for backwards compatibility. OK, uh, I think this is it. We should uh, uh, make a break maybe for 20 minutes, and then we'll proceed. And then. Uh -huh. See. So yeah, uh, we uh, we are going to attach a new library uh, to utilize a new library in our code. In order to utilize it, we should add it, this code to dependencies. So at line twenty seven, you see a dependencies section of this. Uh, yes. Yeah. So yes. we we just going to put it here. So just, just copy and, paste. Just copy paste. Yeah, somewhere. Yeah, somewhere. I, I I think I did. Uh, do I have like repeat those dependencies twice? No, 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 I it's can, just, uh, yeah, uh, why, no, 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 control Z, no, 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 everything correct. You see, uh, local dependencies, and it uh, consists of dependencies. Uh, you have uh, dependency one, dependency two, dependency three. So what are dependencies? As I told you at the very first lecture, it's just libraries, uh, which, mm -hmm. uh, which are automatically downloaded. But now you see it's red, because it's, it's not, not downloaded. downloaded. And you have this MM symbol in the uh, upper right uh, uh, corner of your screen. Uh, See this uh, and uh, M uh, and yeah, 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 just yeah, push, yeah. push, click it, click. And now it's going to download it. Oh, oh wow, it's not, so easy. it's just that, <laughs> yeah, it's very easy. You just download it, the library from internet and you can utilize its classes in your code. So that's how that's how you you attach uh, libraries to to your code actually when you are using Maven. 
other uh, other uh, is Maven just like library or it is like big server with different libraries or other like uh, the similar to Maven uh, some stuff uh, I see like when, I see it. yeah uh, Maven Maven itself is a build system so it mm -hmm. it does many many things for you it builds your code it runs uh, tests it runs uh, sort of uh, it it does it via plugins so it has lots of plugins and it uh, builds your code so uh, uh, this is what what Maven is. Besides that, we have another thing with the name Maven, but it's uh, another thing. A thing called Maven Central. Mm -hmm. Maven Central. Yeah, I, I remember. I, rem I remember yeah. this. I just asked uh, this to do not repeat for you and don't spend time. I mm -hmm. just asked this. So okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and we we have other uh, other uh, I don't know repositories for for libraries, uh, but Maven Central is the default for Maven. So uh, yes, and uh, uh, you may uh, I, I can see only half. Oh, okay, yeah. So uh, uh, you I I see you have something in your main method. So maybe you just create another class. Called... Yeah, I I just prepared uh, to create uh, how our <laughs> uh, maybe visualize or something like this. We are going to visualize stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, enter. Okay, hope. And. Okay, uh, yeah. PSVM, PSVM. Yeah, okay. It's going to write main method for you. Okay, and uh, I'm going to send you another another magic method. Just copy and paste. Uh, if if you see that uh, something is freezing, it's just because I uh, changed to Telegram and uh, uh -huh, it I stopped see. demonstrating. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, and uh, this method you can just uh, copy and paste uh, to uh, to your freshly created uh, class. This uh, one. I, I see its method, so it will be outside. Yeah, 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 sure. So you copy pasted it, and we have lots of uh, red stuff here, right? And how do we fix it? Just yes. I <laughs> and uh, LGV, L you see LGV, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just alt enter, alt enter, alt enter. Yeah, import class. Uh, import class, yeah, okay, import yeah. class. Uh, import and uh, this. Okay. Yeah. So now, we have just done. Yeah. Now it's going to compile. And you see this uh, org ATP fifth LGV LGV thing. It's a uh, it's a class that's uh, originally located in in the library that we automatically uh, attached and downloaded. Mm -hmm. So th this is how you utilize uh, external libraries. I just uh, wanted to to show you this. Okay. And uh, now now uh, what, what's LGV is about. LGV is a thing that was written by Professor John Hamer in uh, New Zealand uh, way ago in 2004, if I'm not mistaken. And it's a special, a special tool for studying Java. And uh, uh, this thing visualizes internal representation of Java objects. And we'll see how it, uh, how it does so. Uh, so uh, in your main method, uh, please write the if, if if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, one of our teachers said that this man uh, has a book about like code Java that uh, like he has some cool books. Oh no no no, it's not no? Uh, maybe no no. I think you I don't know about any any books from uh, John Kramer. Okay. 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 Uh, so another uh, another thing that I would want is uh, 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 just call visualize. Just write on line thirteen. Visualize. Visualize. Line 13, uh, yeah. Visualize, we just call this. Yes, and the uh, first argument is going to be, to be a new LGV. Just create new, new LGV. Yeah, create new LGV. Yes, and the second argument is going to be any object that we want to visualize. I'm going to talk about strings today. So let it be any string, just a hello string, maybe. Just uh, uh, put the uh, hello. You, hello. No, uh, uh, okay. Uh, you you uh, can uh, put it like this. You can put it like this, comma, and uh, create new string. How would you create new string? Okay, in this way, then it, and, okay. And what's the argument? Uh, uh, hello. Hello. And uh, why do you think, okay, uh, and uh, uh, cool, cool. <laughs> uh, see, it's uh, now it's red. Why it's red? Maybe because we're calling it maybe in unable exception Java. Unhandle exception. exceptions. This is uh, uh, this is the stuff that uh, I was talking about <laughs> in the first part. So what should we do now? What should we do? Change now? change uh, our uh, we we should uh, this is this to 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 main. So somewhere here should be uh, throw yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, can... yeah. And you can, as, as usual, you can, yes, just uh, use Alt Enter and uh, IntelliJ IDEA will do everything for us. See? Mm -hmm. uh, so now, now the code is going to compile. And uh, you can see that a new string is gray. Uh, mm -hmm. be that's because IntelliJ IDEA is not very happy about this code. <laughs> uh, because actually, actually, you needed a new string uh, as an object. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, the thing, the thing, hello in uh, in, in these quotes, in these double quotes, mm -hmm. is itself a string object. You don't need to create another string that ropes hello. So you can okay. just push Alt Enter, just Alt Enter, or, or, or whatever. Uh, no, 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 not not here. On on new string, maybe yeah. Uh, uh, just click on new string, Alt Enter, and the clean up code. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it will it will clean up code for you. But <laughs> later, later, just in a moment, we'll try to to run this stuff with new string, and we'll see what happens internally. So uh -huh. uh, now it's uh, going to compile and run. So please run, run it. Just uh, press uh, 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 green, uh, not up. You, if you are press it here, you you are going to run app. By the way, oh, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, what yeah, yeah. you need to run visualize. So on 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 line twelve, you you have this green triangle. So you can run it uh, from line 12 or line 13. Yeah, run visualize main. It's uh, what we need. And let's uh, let's see what happens. It's it's uh, it's uh, it it's should, only... it should... uh, okay, no, it's... no 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 it it opened I... it should open it should open no 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 errors. See if it opened uh, if it opened the uh, web browser for you. You are just not sharing it. Uh, yeah yeah it's uh, let let me see. Uh, yeah, it's actually opened. Uh, I'm not really want to share it, but uh, you okay, don't I really don't... want to share your browser. No, 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 no. It's it just uh, it's nothing. We want like... <laughs> okay, okay. I will I will change uh, I will change it to my. Uh, uh, yeah, because we need browser. Sorry, sorry okay. about this. <laughs> no, should, no problem. I you should I close just... other 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 tabs. But yeah, uh, yeah. This is actually what we have here. This is actually what we have here. So what happened actually? Uh, we run this uh, LJV library, and this LJV library, uh, as a first argument of uh, LJV, we uh, passed a very simple object, a string hello, and uh, mm -hmm. it analyzed its internals, and uh, it uh, wrote this uh, the the code uh, which you see on the left uh, part of the screen. On the left part, this of the is screen, this is actually looks like some uh, HTML, HTML or JavaScript. It's not tag. HTML. Like... It's not yeah. It looks like, but it's not HTML. It's uh, <laughs> it's uh, this language is called uh, dot language, D O T dot. language. Yeah, it's a, a language that uh, that is used for visual uh, for graph uh, visualization. Visualization. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, quite a complicated language. Yeah, it has parts that uh, quite resemble HTML because what we have here is HTML table, of course, but it's not HTML and uh, it just resembles HTML in some parts. But you see that it's uh, it has uh, curly braces and stuff like this. Uh, so it's uh, it's a language on its own. And uh, uh, the the website that's opened it's just an online executor of uh, dot language. You can you can install GraphViz on your machine uh, and uh, just convert these dot files to PN, PNG pictures or SVG pictures. Uh, but uh, just for convenience, just for convenience, we are opening a web browser and uh, it converts this dot dot uh, language to uh, to a picture. And the mm -hmm. picture that we see here is quite uh, quite simple. We see a string object, and we see what's inside this string object. And uh, inside string object, we have fields. Yes, we have three fields, and uh, actually four fields, because fourth field is a uh, array of bytes. And this array of bytes actually holds uh, the internal data of string. It looks like hash map a bit. Uh, it looks mm -hmm. like a hash map, yes, uh, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, hash map looks similar because in hash map, we also have an array of buckets. It's cool that you know about it. Uh, but uh, it's much more simplistic because uh, it's just an array wrapped in an object. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I think it will be more. Uh, I think it uh, will be more clear for everyone if you uh, if we look have a look at uh, string uh, source code. If you switch to back to to your idea, if you switch back to your idea, uh, and uh, you can oh, see or not? Uh, no, we we just can't see your browser. 
Okay, uh, I will, I will, uh, let's like this. No? Uh, uh, can we see, uh, you can put new string, by the way. You can uh, get back to a new string here. Yeah, new string. Uh, you, you now can see my... Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we, we now can, you new string, let's be a new uh, string. And uh, yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, okay. And uh, uh, can you make control click or whatever, just uh, to fall through control click on string to, to get ah, okay. to... To get to a source of uh, show, no, no, it's going to be uh, source code. No, we we have to to fall through. Ah, uh, I understood code. to the to document uh, to, not no, to no, documentation, no. but to the source code of string itself. Uh, Java to, to, string to, to. maybe uh, uh, go to maybe go to go to. Uh, I I can't uh, go see. to the implementations, maybe. Oh. Yeah, we see. Actually, we see that uh, string is a complex thing, as any uh, as any library stuff. But uh, you see this this value, this coder, this hash. If we control mm -hmm. click on value, I don't know how to to make control click on uh, Mac, but I, it should I, just uh, just uh, or go to uh, I don't know declaration. Go to okay. I I, I understood, but it, it's uh, the implement uh, declaration. Yeah, declaration. Yeah, let it be declaration. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, see we have a private final byte value. It's actually internal uh, internal data of string, like uh, uh, characters uh, of string, and uh, coder and hash and hash is zero. Uh, so actually, uh, these three coder hash and hash and zero. Um, low level details and I think we don't have time to, to explain it now, but uh, uh, actually the most important uh, thing about string is that it's just uh, an object that ropes, uh, that ropes an array. And uh, so it's like an array of check characters, yeah? Array of characters, array of bytes actually, and uh, if uh, this uh, starting from Java 9 it works the following way. Uh, if uh, your string contains only uh, Latin alphabet characters, Latin alphabet and some uh, numbers and uh, some, uh, I don't know, commas, braces and something like this, then it will use uh, one byte per character because we have this ASCII uh, uh, character table. And if uh, uh, the, string, uh, the string contains only Latin characters, it's going to use one byte, byte per character. Uh, uh, if uh, if uh, it contains I don't know some uh, uh, Cyrillic alphabet, if it's going to contain I don't know some extended Latin alphabet like those that uh, used in uh, Estonian language, then it's going to use uh, two bytes per character, and it's going to use UTF-16 uh, um, uh, coding. Uh, it's actually yes, it's actually described here. So if uh, if you are using only Latin Latin alphabet, uh, the string are going to be compact, are going to take less memory. Mm. Uh, but not only this. Uh, if we explore string class, because uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about string class because string class is the most commonly used class <laughs> in your programs. Yeah. First of mm -hmm. all, you you are using integers. I don't know doubles, some primitives, but string is the next thing. Uh, the next thing that you are going to use. And uh, what else? String is immutable. What uh, what does this mean? If we need another string, uh, or if we need a modified string, we'll just create a new string with modified value. Also, this is a byte of values uh, at line one hundred fifty six. Uh, it's encapsulated. It's private field, so you don't have access to this field. You only have uh, access to some methods of string, but uh, they won't allow you to to change its uh, internal uh, representation. So uh, let's uh, go back to our uh, visualized Java uh, and uh, uh, maybe uh, run it with. Uh, um, let's add new uh, some uh, uh, another variant. Uh, before new string, uh, could you please write a new string uh, array? So just before new string, uh, just left the left. New, uh, just, let's pass array of string. Yeah, new string and uh, no, no, new string. Yeah, uh, square brackets, but remove uh, round braces. 
new string yeah yeah and curly brace open no 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 oh. not common uh, open uh. curly brace yeah and uh, now we can declare an array of strings so uh, in inside it yes you can use just hello new string hello and maybe another new string hello uh. just write hello here yes uh, comma and uh, 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 you just can copy and paste uh, this new string hello from, from the right side. And uh, yeah, you can, uh, this gray one, uh, the whole gray uh, block yeah. with new string hello. So we need uh, to check what's going to be. Yeah, uh, uh, just uh, move it. Inside? The, inside no, no, the not, in, not, not inside just, double quotes. Uh, uh, just, uh, yeah, and comma yeah. and another, another time, another new string hello. Just comma and another, yeah. And uh, to, to, to the right of the curly brace, please delete everything. Delete uh, to, to the right of, yeah, this one should be deleted, should be removed. Yeah, now we have, uh, is it going to compile? Maybe we, we forgot we have forgot closing closing uh, uh -huh. brace, yeah, yeah. Okay, brain. okay, so uh, let's try to imagine what's going to happen now. Before, before, we, before we run this, uh, let's try to imagine what's going to happen. We have uh, now we have an array, right? Uh, uh -huh. And it's an array of strings. And actually, we have uh, uh, oh, you, uh, it's like <laughs> something to change, like uh, oh, okay. But uh, I think uh, that for 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 uh, for for one thing that I want to to show you, let's uh, let's leave two of them the same. Let it be, yeah, hello, yeah, uh, and like okay. this. Let's leave two of them the same, and another that one, uh, let it be, let it be just another. Okay, so, so we, okay. Have, uh, we have three uh, array of three strings, actually, and maybe, mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, let's put another hello in double quotes as second argument, uh, as a second, as a second uh, element of array. Let's uh, just double uh -huh. the, the, this one. No, uh, no, not here, to, to the left, before new. Yeah, before new. Okay. No, 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 uh, no, no. To to the right, to the right, to the right. After hello in double quotes, let's put another hello. So okay. let it be hello, hello, new string, hello, and smile, new string, hello, and smile. Uh, let it be the same hello as the first one, because uh, I want to show you when it's deduplicated and when it duplicates. So uh, okay. we, uh, yeah, we we are going to see what what's going to be deduplicated. Before you run, uh, let's everyone imagine what, what, we're, what we're doing. So we are going to visualize an array of how many? Of four elements, right? We have four elements. Oh, how, however, one of them will be kind of simple uh, string and, and another will be uh, like- Rock uh, string, sort of rock yeah, string. Rope. But yeah. uh, uh, actually, uh, we'll see what it's going to be, what's, uh, what Java is going to do for us. And uh, yeah, we have uh, actually two different strings, uh, two different in terms of uh, equals to, like uh, compar comparison of strings. So mm -hmm. uh, let's run and see, and uh, then we'll try to explain what we'll see. Okay. okay. Uh, so we go. You can this. run it, and it will open your browser, and you just yes, share, share, uh, share the browser. Oh, it's oh okay. Uh, it's uh, appeared something interesting. Uh, let me. It, uh, and it shows uh, some some warning, but yeah. Oh yeah, here here we go. We have four elements. Uh, just do, don't mind what's on the left because uh, it's just <laughs> it's just yeah, source code source code some visualization. Yeah, the interesting thing is on the right. We have this uh, visualization of uh, array. So on top we have an array, and this array has four elements. And you see that actually actually. Uh, uh, Java did duplicated first two strings for us. Why I did so? Because first two hellos, first two hellos were literals. You just use double quotes to define these objects. Mm -hmm. So uh, Java uh, compiler and the Java runtime was smart enough to understand that these are actually the same object. So, so that not uh, utilize too much memory for this, not to utilize unneeded uh, memory. It just reused this object twice as a zero and first element of the array. Mm, okay, and these, uh, they and were... this, uh, they, uh, these two, uh, they're just strings because uh, uh, there is no such thing as rope string. You, you, you're creating string, but you can create a string from a string in Java. But uh, in the end, you will get string, right? And this string will uh, contain hello with a smile. 
uh, but <laughs> Uh, and this, uh, these two objects must be different objects. They must be different. Java uh, doesn't have right to deduplicate them. Why? Because you're using new operator. And it's a contract of new operator. Then when you are using new operator, a new object must appear. So we have basically, we have two objects here. And these are different objects. But see how interesting. Still, they share, they share the, the, same. Same, uh, the same buffer. Yeah. And why, why, why do they share the same buffer? Um, I think because they just take the same memory uh, amount and... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, they, it's, they... it's the reason. It's the reason why, uh, why it's, it's done so. Because, uh, yes, we, we, we deduplicate memory. We don't uh, uh, just use more memory than when we need. But how it happened? You, 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 you wrote first... Uh, new string hello and a smile and the second new string and hello and smile uh, uh how it worked out can you imagine hello and a smile what is it is it string it's a string literal right it's just a simple value in double quotes yes. somewhere in between of the execution there was an object called string and this object called string uh, uh was uh, that uh, hello and a smile and uh, this object was deduplicated because it's a string li uh, literal. And when we created these new strings as a second and third element of array, it just understood that uh, it can reuse. Uh, we are creating string from string, so we can reuse uh, the buffer. So string is immutable. Once you create a string, you cannot change its internal state. So if you are creating a string from string, or if you are appending, I don't know, empty string to, to a string, it will be the same one. So also you must uh, create a new object in certain circumstances, like when you're calling you. We can still uh, reuse uh, its internal buffer. So this is it. This is actual representation of how, uh, how it works in memory. And you see how Java tries to reduce uh, memory consumption, even in such uh, uh, simple examples. Actually, <laughs> this is all that uh, I uh, wanted to show at this point. So thank you for, for the demo. And, and one, one question. So as far as I can see, these, um, these, like, uh, these tables, the S3 tables, they look like those you showed us. So they kind of like class and it's uh, like not signature uh, instance field. Yeah. And this is uh, kind of uh, method that, uh, so this is like all the, Mm, yeah, yeah, I understood your yeah. question. Yeah, let, let, uh -huh. me, <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me ask your question for you. Uh, you, you mean uh, that I've shown you, uh, I've shown you UML diagrams, uh -huh. right? Uh, yes. Unified model language diagrams. What I showed you before in UML diagrams was uh, so-called class diagrams. So uh, these diagrams, they uh, visualized classes and uh, fields and classes and methods and classes. What yeah, we and see this here is not that, yeah, these are instances actually. In uh, uh, UML, we also have a so called object diagram, object diagram notation, but this is not UML notation. This is uh, just for the sake of simplicity, it's just. Uh, okay. Uh, as I told you, and uh, you, you you now have seen it with your own eyes. Yes, string is just uh, an immutable array. So uh, this is called string literal. And uh, uh, this is an example that not in order to create a new object in Java, you not necessarily need to use new operator. For, for some special cases, we have literals. And the uh, string is, uh, uh, and uh, this uh, value in double quotes is an example of string literal, uh, which creates actually a, an object. And uh, if we need uh, another string with uh, just another value, we must create another string, literally another object. And the uh, strings are immutable, and this is important. Uh, so in, about internal uh, representation, I, I already told you, uh, and uh, uh, this is how the duplication works. Uh, when we write uh, this, this to, to, to strings like John Doe, 
uh, Java compiler is smart enough to, to see that uh, these are actually the same strings. So the, it puts it into an, some structure called the string constant pool. And uh, each time you are using the same string literal, it will just uh, reuse it. Uh, just reuse an object from uh, string constant pool, so it won't uh, allocate new memory for, for the string. But uh, when you are creating new string uh, with new operator, generally you should not do this, actually. Uh, it cannot uh, utilize constant pool, it will create a new object, but as you saw uh, before from LGV visualization, it will still reuse uh, uh, its uh, internal buffer. Uh, how to compare strings? Uh, so how do you write? Uh, uh, no, no, no. This, this, this one is very, very, very tricky. It works like 50-50. So uh, we use uh, another one. Of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we use another one. Yeah, great. Uh, it's great that you actually know it. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it works 50-50. And now you understand why it works 50-50. It might work. If uh, the string is from string pool, constant pool, right? So it's um, just uh, now. Now we now I get it because we we like no one told us why it should, it should, it doesn't work. And now if it's uh, the instance like they create it in the same way, yeah, they if will it's be... actually the same instance, then equals equals will yield you true because equals mm. equals in Java compares instances, not uh, internals of instances. Yes, and it's great that now you you uh, you plainly see it. Equals equals can com, uh, compares instances, and if it is the same instance, say from from a string constant pool, then it's going to be true, of course. But you have no guarantee uh, because string constant uh, pool is an internal uh, is an internal structure in JVM runtime. And uh, uh, you have no contracts about uh, string con constant pool. It doesn't uh, uh, promise that it will deduplicate everything for you. So uh, writing, uh, writing it like this in Java is prohibited. It's novice's error, and it doesn't make sense in any case. So just uh, don't write it this way. Yes, you can write it this in Kotlin. You can write this in... Python, you can write this in JavaScript or with triple equals. I don't know. In Java, you just cannot write it. And please don't uh, and, do that. And, yeah. and one question. So the operator equals, yes, that compares strings. There is a, also a structure like a switch statement with like case, 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 and default. So yeah. it's actually use. It's uh, like actually very simplistic way to like write to compare strings by, by uh, using this like case case so case is case, actually case uses very... uh, case uh, actually case uses uh, equals to compare okay strings. okay uh -huh. thank case you case internally uses equals to compare strings so uh, you uh, have two questions in chat uh, okay uh, uh, case uh, so you can uh, actually use a uh, case uh, for for strings and it will work correctly somehow i just lost uh, a window with uh, with people online i'm i'm just uh, 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 watching you on separate screen but okay i just uh, don't see anyone but uh, okay just just uh, um, just unmute and say something all right, so now we understand that this, this is uh, incorrect. And yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for the question. You still can uh, use a string in switch uh, statements. And uh, what's the correct way? It's uh, this one. We might think it's correct, but it's still not the best way to compare strings. Why? Because if A is null, then we'll get null pointer exception here because equals is a method on an object. And if some object is null and uh, A might be null, we just don't know, uh, this will get us null pointer exception while we want it uh, just to be false because we uh, pretty we just want to, to know that if it's a John Doe string or it's not. If it's John Doe string, then it's true. If it's not, including null, then we want it uh, to be false. Uh, to avoid this, uh, experienced folks uh, write the code like this. First, 
we are using string literal, it gives us uh, an object. When we put dot and equals a, this is the correct way to compare strings in your code. Please remember it uh, uh, once and uh, for, for all the time, for the rest of your life. This is the correct way to compare strings in Java language. Not this one, this one. Because here we might experience null pointer exception. Here we will never experience null, null pointer exception because this is an object. It, it, it never yields null. So this equals mes, uh, method uh, uh, also works here. And if it's null, it will just uh, give us uh, false. Hope you understand this trick. And yes, please remember it. And if you want to, to compare uh, case insensitively, say no, no matter in which case, uh, uppercase or lowercase, uh, A is, so you can use uh, equals ignore case. Uh, if you want to, to check if a string is not empty, uh, you must, uh, first you must check it for now. So Java is not a null safe uh, language, unlike Kotlin, for example, at Kotlin you have separate types for nullable and non-nullable. Uh, variables in Java, you don't have them, so you should be uh, cautious about uh, possible null values. And uh, <clears throat> there is also a handy method called is blank on the string. Uh, if string is not null, uh, you can call is blank on the string, and it will check that there is something in the string besides spaces, tabs, carriage returns, and other useless garbage. Some meaningful <laughs> characters are in this string, so. Uh, uh, these, uh, uh, the last four points are actually useful, uh, useful patterns to utilize in your code. Uh, these two, please avoid. Don't do this. And uh, this one is uh, also not the best way to compare strings. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, we can actually, we can intern strings. Uh, we can actually put it into string constant pool, but uh, uh, let's don't do it. Let's uh, just know that uh, there is such a possibility. And I saw at least uh, one uh, question on Oracle exam about string in turn. So uh, I have to <laughs> uh, just uh, have to tell you about it. In string, you have in turn method. So if we create uh, like a string like this and we have uh, this picture uh, and when we call uh, in turn on each and every of these strings, all of them will be put to string constant pool and thus they duplicated. But uh, in turn method, also it's public method, uh, it's intended to use only by, uh, uh, by the authors of standard Java library. It's not intended to use by you, by users of uh, uh, standard libraries. So we can understand what string constant pool is. We can understand when strings are deduplicated in, in order to better understand what's going on under the hood of Java virtual machine, but we should not use intern method. If we need to deduplicate strings, we can do it manually using a hash map. I will explain you later what hash map, how we can use hash map in Java. Uh, uh, all right, uh, we have uh, some methods on strings. We can do, do stuff with things, with strings. And uh, I think you already know about concatenation and it's, uh, uh, being used uh, with plus operator. And uh, uh, this is the only example of uh, operator overloading in Java language, actually, because uh, also string, uh, string uh, class has a uh, concat method. And actually when you, you're using this, uh, this is equals to calling foo.concat uh, bar. But uh, uh, it's just uh, the code will look more idiomatic, uh, more clear if we use just plus. So Java language designers uh, decided to allow plus for string concatenation. And this is the only exception when we use arithmetical operators uh, for, for doing stuff with objects. This is again, unlike other languages in C++, you can uh, introduce uh, operators which you like any crazy operators. In Kotlin, it's easy to overload the arithmetical operators and you can use plus to, I don't know, adding person and uh, its salary, <laughs> I don't know, like uh, you just overload uh, uh, arithmetic operators and you can use it in your language. Java, you can, you just can. So uh, uh, 
plus operator is overloaded. And uh, it's a pity that equals equals operator operator is not overloaded in strings and uh, non overloaded usage of equals equals operator is doesn't just doesn't make sense in Java language. Uh, but uh, we just cannot change anything in Java because of uh, uh, because of backwards compatibility. So things are what they are. Please use uh, equals to compare strings in Java and never use equals equals. In Kotlin, by the way, hmm, I should not uh, tell you about Kotlin because I'm telling you about Java. But <laughs> uh, in Kotlin, by the way, you can use equals equals uh, to compare strings and uh, it, uh, it will do this correctly. It will understand that it should actually use equals method. So compare strings by internals, not just by uh, instances. Uh, okay, uh, another tricks and another things that you should know about strings. Uh, there is a, uh, as you already understand, string is uh, an immutable object. So each time you concatenate two strings, a new string appear. And uh, imagine uh, you have to add, uh, I don't know, 100 or 100,000 strings in a loop. And how it's going to, to, to be look like? Say we, we want to, to create a huge string uh, called 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, 10, 11, and up to uh, 100,000, for example. If you do this loop and you uh, pl uh, plus equals also works for strings, by the way. So result plus equals line for item is equal to result equals result plus. And uh, how it's going to work uh, internally. As you saw, string is an immutable uh, array. So inside you will have an array of one element and uh, we're adding another. So we are uh, going to allocate array of two elements and copy, uh, copy values from previous strings to, to a new third string. And now we have two elements. Now we're adding third element. We should allocate a new array of three elements and copy previous value and a new one. Then four elements and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, you see, in order to, to do this, uh, uh, if you want to concatenate 100,000 strings, 100,000 arrays should be allocated. And uh, with each allocated, we are going to allocate more and more and more and more memory. And of course, this is what yields us uh, quadratic complexity. It's uh, big O of uh, N squared complexity. We, uh, we actually just recently got the uh, understanding what this uh, O means. It's kind of like efficiency. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, it's going to be like, uh, let, me, uh, let me reiterate on this because it's quite, uh, uh, quite an important stuff. Like, uh, uh, see, one, two, three, four, five elements. And uh, if we, we are going to uh, proceed with uh, creating them, uh, we are going to create, to allocate in total the number of elements, which is equal to, to um, uh, uh, to number of elements in this triangle, right? And number of elements in this triangle is equal to a uh, number of rows times number of columns uh, divided by two, roughly speaking. So if uh, it's uh, columns and rows are the same, then it's n, uh, n squared divided by two. And this is actually uh, asymptotically equals to n squared. So it's, uh, we say that it's a big O to n squared. Yes, and it's, uh, um, this is not a very effective way to, to do things. Yeah, because uh, we uh, more effective is O at N and even more effective is O at uh, logarithm N and even more effective if we can do it in constant time. But uh, it's, uh, it's bad, uh, it's worse, like it's worse. And uh, this is catastrophic if we have two uh, exponential, exponential uh, complexity then we just cannot do too many things. We just cannot, we can, uh, if algorithm has an exponential co uh, complexity, we can run it for, I don't know, 
two or three or four n equals to some small values. If it's going to be 100, then we'll just run out of resources very soon. So this one is catastrophic. This is not very performant. Uh, these are okay. So this is not very performant way to, to do a string con 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 concatenation in Java. And uh, uh, that's why we should avoid the uh, concatenation in loop. And uh, uh, for this uh, for this task, we have a special class called String Builder, which uh, is used to build, as, as its name assumes, to build a string from known parts. Uh, like we we can uh, allocate String Builder of uh, of some length if we know average length width and we know average number of items. We can uh, allocate a buffer for this String Builder in advance, but if it's a wrong number of, if we have wrong number of characters, it's uh, uh, it's okay. It will reallocate it for us. And uh, here, uh, B is a mutable is mutable object, so we can mutate its internal st uh, state. We can append to String Builder new uh, values, and it will expand its uh, buffer, but and uh, it will work way more efficiently than. Uh, concatenation in a loop. So this is how you usually use string builder to, to build a big string from many uh, smaller strings or smaller lines. So please remember uh, string builder class is your friend and create for creating strings. Okay, string length. Uh, you can just use length and it will give you uh, the length of string in UTF-16 code units, and it's uh, <laughs> it's difficult to understand stuff because uh, Unicode is a difficult stuff. Really, if we have some I don't know hieroglyphic languages or some emojis, uh, uh, so uh, UTF-16 code unit uh, nearly always the same as letter in our understanding. So uh, if we're using, I don't know, Kyrillic alphabet or Jewish or Estonian or any, any other alphabet, uh, UTF-16 code unit is uh, equal to, uh, to one symbol. But strictly speaking, it's not uh, so. So if you are doing uh, really, uh, if you really want to support all the language in all the UTF-16, you should use a code point count. It's the real string length and code points in the sense of UTF-16. Uh, but for, for you to know, in 100% uh, in of cases, uh, uh, dot length will, will work for you in your work. You just need to know that it's more complex than that uh, when speaking about supporting real support of uh, Unicode. Uh, we also get a character, uh, a character or UTF code unit at a given position, and it's fast operation because we're just uh, getting it from an array, and uh, getting value from array is a fast operation uh, in any language. And there are also useful methods on strings uh, that uh, you can utilize to to process string, and the string processing is the stuff that you. Uh, you are doing always when writing code. So you can get its length, you can get character at position, you can compare string and get uh, uh, compare lexicography. I mean, A is less than B, B is less than C and so on. Uh, so you can check if a uh, string starts with some prefix or ends with some suffix. It's, uh, it's a typo here, it should be suffix here. So, uh, uh, these are useful methods. And there are methods on string, which I uh, often call harmful methods. They are, they are still on string class and you can utilize them. And many novice programmers tend to utilize these methods uh, when, they, uh, th when they are processing, try to process strings. Uh, but actually I would like to warn you against using these methods if you're, if you're about to process a string and if you want to use, say, index of, oh, I need to split my string by some, I don't know, by some separator. 
I need to extract some substring in my string. Let's find a certain character. Let's find its uh, index. And then uh, starting from this index, I can just, uh, I don't know, get a substring of this thing. So this is a naive, a naive approach of string parsing. And uh, I must warn you against it because usually it gives very poor performance and usually it uh, uh, gives many bugs. If you don't know how to parse string, please don't use uh, this index of uh, replace and split stuff. I just warned you. I will tell you how to parse string correctly uh, in, in the following slides. <clears throat> it's difficult. Actually, it's hard stuff, but uh, uh, you should understand that uh, there are right approach for string parses. Okay, it's uh, going to be another file. Let me switch to slide number five. We definitely, uh, uh, we definitely don't have uh, enough time to cover all the slides in this, uh, in, in this file, but I expect you to, to have a look. At, uh, at these slides. So they are in English and Russian, so uh, you just go through them. Uh, uh, does anyone know about regular expression? Who knows what is regular expression? So, so. So, so. So you M at least- Maybe in another way. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. another way to say it, to call them. Okay. so. Okay, regular expression, at least uh, somebody heard something. Uh, regular expression is a uh, language uh, for string parsing. It's a um, specific language. It's, uh, it's not a part of Java language. Uh, you can use regular expression in uh, Unix utilities. You can use regular expression, uh, expressions in other languages as well. So it's a separate language and uh, as any language, you must learn it. And uh, there are quite a thick, quite thick books. Uh, oh, I'm not just, ah, I just uh, I turned off my video camera. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are book, books that thick about uh, regular expressions. So it's a big topic in itself, uh, but, uh, Unfortunately or fortunately, this is something every programmer should know. So please take a note, regular expression. I, I must learn them. I must just go to Wikipedia and uh, just start learning regular expression uh, because it's the best way to in maybe 90% or higher, uh, mm -hmm. every uh, tasks related to parsing the string can be solved with regular expression. Uh, as you can see in this uh, in this example, for example, we we have a string that uh, represents some um, time, like eleven fifty nine a.m., and we need to parse the string and we need to extract hours, minutes, and this a.m. p.m. part. How do we do this? We write this uh, regular expression. It's quite weird looking stuff, but it's a formal language. Just need to learn it. And uh, uh, actually, it's a pattern. Like it says. Uh, first, we need uh, a character one to nine because uh, uh, nothing, nothing else at, at first position doesn't make sense. Uh, at second position, uh, we have uh, one uh, or uh, if it's an uh, hour, like one to nine, right? If it's uh, not, if it's a two digit hour, then it's first must be one and second must be zero, one or two. So 11. 10, 11, 12 hours. These are two digit hours. And the uh, first one is first digit hour. So it's uh, uh, vertical, vertical lines mean, uh, means alternative. So here we, we can parse out uh, the correct number for, for hours. And if it will be, I don't know, 13 or uh, 44, 42, it won't parse it because uh, there is no such thing as 42 hours. Right, so uh, we already have a pattern that restricting us from uh, from getting wrong results. Uh, uh, these things means any any space, so we can put space here and will be just ignored. Any number of uh, space characters. Now we have uh, uh, semicolon colon. Now we have colon, and then to to 
to numbers and this AMPM uh, stuff in, in the end. And uh, when we wrote this, uh, this expression, as I told you, you must learn how to, to, to write this expression. We can match uh, the string against this pattern. And when we match the, the string against this pattern, we can extract, uh, we can extract sub strings. And it's uh, as easy as, uh, as that. We just uh, matched it and we have groups and the uh, groups are located in, uh, in round braces. So here we have first group, it's hours. The second group in round uh, braces is uh, minutes. And uh, the last group is uh, AMPM. And now it's easy to work with this value. Now we split, correctly split it to three values. It's string values, but we know that uh, it will be correct hours, no 42 hours, only uh, one to, to 11 or 12. And uh, the same for minutes and the same for AMPM. And we ignored all the un meaning meaningless stuff like spaces. So there might be two spaces, three spaces. Uh, pattern will, will check it. So uh, matching with the regular expression is a very powerful tool to extract, uh, to extract the data from strings and you must learn it. Uh, so uh, there is also um, uh, there is also a, a pattern for finding and replacing values in the loop. As I told you, uh, there is a replace method in string, which can replace I don't know some subsequence to another subsequence. And uh, novice programmers they tend to use this replace, replace, replace. Uh, but please uh, remember that each time you you are calling replace it's going to create a whole new string for you and copy all its value. So uh, using replace in the loop is uh, suboptimal. You will have poor perf code performance here. That's why I call replace uh, harmful method. Instead of this, you should use uh, this, uh, this pattern with, uh, mm, this pattern with uh, string builder and pattern and matcher. It has uh, some, uh, you can use this code pattern to, uh, replace values in a long string uh, by finding some pattern and replacing it with the value that you needed. So using uh, using string builder, uh, using this method append replacement and append tail, uh, you can just replace all the needed values in a long string and it will work uh, very fast. Uh, so what what do I have to say about regular expression? It has, they, they have uh, big advantages. It can validate string format and uh, it can be very complicated and it works nicely. Uh, it's tolerable to some you know, garbage that can occur in input string like separators, like spaces, like some, some uh, characters that doesn't, don't bring us any meaning, but we can, safely ignore them and it's uh, very effectively done with uh, regular expression. And regular expression has matching and groups and groups are powerful device for data extra uh, extraction. So you can extract, I don't know, card numbers, uh, emails, uh, personal data from, <laughs> from uh, text using regular expression. And people do this actually. And uh, uh, all this is very, very powerful tool for string processing. But of course, uh, regular expressions uh, have their disadvantages. Uh, <laughs> we have to pay the price and uh, you have to learn regular expression. As, uh, as I told you, there are books that speak about only about regular expressions. But also uh, do, don't be afraid. You can, uh, the basics of regular expressions you can learn quite quickly. Uh, as usual, uh, devil is in, in details. And uh, you have to use them correctly because in regular expression, it, it's quite easy to write an expression that will work in a suboptimal way, in quadratic or even exponential way. So you can write a poor, a poor regular expression and it will just explode your computer when you try to match a pattern on, on a long string. It will just... Uh, uh, stack it will utilize 100% of CPU uh, because the expression that you wrote uh, will cause uh, a, the machine to work exponentially longer. So uh, 
unfortunately, you <laughs> have to learn uh, reg regexps. And uh, as you already saw, they look horribly because uh, this, this stuff is not human readable. <laughs> Of course, uh, uh, IntelliJ IDEA will help you with this. It highlights regular expressions. It validates regular expressions. But anyway, uh, all, all the programmers know that regular expressions are ugly, and, but we have what we have. So please learn regular expression, please use them. You may, might not love them because they are ugly, but you have to, to use them. Okay, besides regular expressions, uh, there are other approaches, other patterns that you may use to, uh, to parse strings. Uh, maybe this is something that uh, I wanted to, uh, to show as a lab by someone of you, but I just believe that we don't have time because it's quite complicated. So I'll just show you, show you the result. Uh, but let's, let's think. Let's imagine we, hold, we have this file, this file, and this is so-called CSV file, comma separated value file. I'm pretty sure every one of you know about such files. And see, we need to parse it, these files. So actually this file uh, have two columns, like name and goods and services, a company provides. But uh, devil is in details. Like uh, here we have uh, before, before the comma, we have a name of the company, say, limited liability company, monkey business. Now we have comma, and it separates first value from the second one, right? And the second value is uh, uh, they pr produce stuff and things, and it's itself comma separated. But we should treat this as a value because it's included into double quotes, see? This is included in double quotes, so this is a value. So this is a value we, we can just use it as one, and we should not uh, we should ignore this comma here. Here we also have double quotes, but we didn't start our line with double quotes, so this is just unquoted value. The next uh, the next example is uh, even more tricky. Tricky is even trickier because we have uh, uh, quotes here. We have a seashore shop and it uses quotes and it's a quoted value, but let's decide if uh, the value is quoted, then double quote, double, double quote will be treated as a single quote here. Yeah, so uh, the result must be after parsing must be LLC, seashore shop in, in quotes, in single quotes, not double ones. And uh, they sell, what do you think? Seashells. And this is just, just a plain unquoted value here. This one should be simple. How would you write a parser for this? So naive approach, as I told you before, a naive approach for parsing uh, CSVs or something, parsing any strings would be, okay, comma separated. This file is called uh, comma separated. Let's just find comma. Uh, comma position, let's just extract this, uh, this substring, this substring, and we are done. Great, but it will work only for the first uh, line here. <laughs> because uh, if we want comma to be included in value and we introduced this quoted, uh, quoted value, we have to treat it somehow, right? And uh, uh, when we, we decided that quotes is going to be a special, special meaning for us, quoted value, uh, then we should uh, also um, invent a method to use quotes in our value. So we decided to just to double them. But after parsing, we should uh, uh, leave only one quote. Does anybody have uh, has an idea of how to, to approach this task? It's a, it's a pragmatic task. It's something that the programmers actually write every day uh, in business solutions. Uh, do you have any idea? Uh, we, we can, so there are some actually steps, like for the first, we should uh, like see if our, co what our commas, so commas, com commas say like divide, uh, like even though not all the lines have commas, so we like looking for commas 
mm -hmm. and uh, we can like divide the string like before comma and after because mm -hmm. here we see that comma is there, like uh, comma every mm, uh, it's actually dividing the um the every every word for, so seashells is like one string and mm -hmm. stuff and things are and uh, like two separate things so commas are actually but here no 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 but do, do you understand that uh, stuff and things should be one string after parsing so we should parse it maybe maybe on this slide i should uh, i should uh, have put uh, the desired desired output the desired yeah. output is name goods and services llc monkey business the next string is going to be staff comma things one string the next string should be llc seashore shop and seashore shop should be in uh, in just single quote here not double and the next string should be seashells yeah, I understand. Thank, th thanks, thanks for, for your answer. I understand your idea, your original idea is to look at the string in, in, as, a, as a whole string, like let's find some uh, uh, suspicious points like commas, right? Yeah, and yeah. let's and let's, yeah. and let's and let's let's see if it's going to be a se separating comma or not separating. Yeah, or, 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 or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so this is the way and uh okay 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 now now i see it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a bit trickier because uh, um so we see that uh, uh that in quotes uh like the the letter the uh, the uh, word that should be in quotes it should be uh, start with big letters so if we have like stuff and things uh, it should be um, like it, it, the, the comma is a quote here shouldn't be because the letters is like a small one not no no uh, no, 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 like... no small no no here here it doesn't matter if it's small or one doesn't matter, doesn't matter. no uh, case of a letter doesn't matter what matters is if after comma if after comma uh, the next value the next um, uh, I don't know, cell of this table starts with a quote. Then we call this uh, uh, cell quoted cell, and we uh, should read it until we reach the end of, uh, of, of the cell and reach uh, and ignoring all the commas, not ignoring, but adding them to, to cell value. And uh, uh, here, here we reach the end of the cell because we reached the quote. But in, uh, in the example below, uh, we are starting uh, some cell value, it's quoted, right? And uh, here we get a quote, and we might think this is the end of the cell, but actually it's not because the next value is also quote. Then we are thinking, okay, uh, it's double quote, so we just reduce it to, to one quote, and we uh, continue parsing until we reach the end of the cell, uh, actual end of the cell, because it's quote, and after the quote we have comma, or something else, uh, but not uh, not two commas, uh, just one after the other. And uh, what I described here is just reasoning reasoning of the machine that might uh, parse the string. And what I'm going to show you is uh, is an approach called the state machine or definite state machine. Uh, that we can use to write uh, to write uh, an algorithm for string parsing and quite powerful algorithms for string parsing. So, uh, as a human, as a human, you you try when you're writing uh, trying to write this algorithm, you're try you are thinking like human, and as a human, you you see you just read all all the strings, right? You are trying to figure out what what's inside it. And you try to teach uh, to teach a machine to 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 reason about string like you do, but uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, it's not always uh, the most correct and most performant way, because uh, the machine uh, is a, is a dumb thing. <laughs> uh, machine is stupid, and uh, it's more performant when it's uh, reasoned not about the thing as a whole. But it isn't by by parts, one character by an, another. Imagine you have only one loop that iterates through characters of this whole big long string. Just one loop, one after another. N A M E comma G O O and so on. <coughs> Can we write such an algorithm 
that it that it will accumulate a value or produce a new um, parsed value as soon as we reach the end of, of the cell. Yes, we can. And we can do it utilizing uh, a concept called state machine. State machine is just, we can visualize it as a graph uh, with uh, transitions and states. So what we have here, states and transitions. Uh, let's see how, how it can work. Uh, we have start uh, state. So at, at the beginning, our machine is uh, in start state. And each transition is, uh, uh, is made by reading the next character from our string. And based on this character, we can decide to which state are we going to transit. Say uh, we started and uh, we got a quote, quote symbol. So if we started for quote symbol, like from like here, we know that we are going to read quoted body now. So we are moving to this state called quoted body. If we started from any other symbol, see there is no, no caption on this arrow. This means that it's any other symbol. Then we are going to read unquoted body and in unquoted body comma is going to be our separator. So if we are reading unquoted body uh, and we read an unquoted body, uh, we are reading character one by one, one by one. And uh, with each character here, we are remaining in unquoted body until the moment when we read a delimiter or comma. So when we read comma, we are going to transfer from unquoted body to start to, to, another, to another cell. And let's see if it's quoted or unquoted. Now you can see that with quoted body, it's a bit more complicated, but still it's quite simple. We read quoted body and uh, in quoted body, uh, we can now ignore commas. Commas doesn't play a role. Uh, commas don't play a role in quoted body, right? But in quoted body, quotes play a role. If in quoted body we read quote, one quote, we still not know if it's going to be end of our cell, or if we are going to read another quote right after this one. So since we don't know, we just transfer to another state called quote read. And from this state, from this state, uh, we can determine if there is another quote read, then we have quote quote in a sequence, and it's going to be this uh, double quote that we should just deduplicate. If we uh, read something, something else, like delimiter or space or something else, uh, then we just finished uh, parsing our finished parsing our cell and we can uh, transfer to, to the start. So this is actually a program, a state machine, uh, just explained in uh, terms of a graph, of graph and transitions. So can, how can it be uh, programmed? Actually, uh, very, very easy. <laughs> uh, we can uh, just start with, uh, when we program state machines, we have uh, a set of states and uh, we can use enum like for, for describing all the states that we want. And uh, we uh, want to have only one uh, loop for iterating through the whole string, one iteration. And uh, inside this loop, we're deciding what to do based on our internal state. Our internal state is going to be start in the beginning. And here inside this loop, based on the character, we are deciding what are we going to do next? Say, if we are in the start mode here in case start, we're just writing this if. If we read quote, then we are transferring to quoted body. If we read something else, then we append uh, what we read just to fill the value and uh, we are moving to unquoted body. So this is just one case that describes this state and all its transitions. Now let's move on to quoted body. Yeah, it's a state and let's describe all its transitions. It's either quote, then we just move to quote read or something else, then we just append the field value here. And re let's remain in quoted body here. The same for quote read, two, two possible transition. And the same for unquoted body, also two possible transitions. It's either comma or not comma. So, uh, there will be quite a big method 
but uh, it's easy to read actually because uh, it's uh, uh, it's written in a pattern. We have uh, trans states, we have transitions, and the, every programmer when he sees like the uh, code like this, uh, they understand. Oh, it's uh, it's just a state machine, so it can be visualized in this way, and it's lightning fast. This algorithm is going to work lightning fast. Why? Because it will take them only n iterations because it's linear complexity is linear it uh, just uh, passes through the whole string only once one character by one character and it will yield everything that that you want so uh, there is a mathematical fact you don't learn it you don't learn uh, 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 theory of uh, uh, theory of formal grammars or formal languages uh, but uh, there is a math mathematical uh, fact that every uh, finite state machine can be converted into regular expression and every regular expression can be expressed as a finite state machine, actually. So actually, uh, we can write a complex regular expression for parsing CSV files, but sometimes we don't have to because uh, it's uh, simpler, it's more clear, to, uh, to define a state machine and write state machine code for, for solving some parsing uh, task than regular expression. But sometimes uh, it's uh, simpler to write uh, regular expressions, but mathematically they are equivalent for each regular expression, you can have definite state machine and vice versa. Uh, and uh, when you're pr processing strings for real world in real world scenarios, you can use regular expressions and you can use uh, definite state machines and you can uh, solve all of your <laughs> uh, practical tasks. Of course, there are, uh, there are examples where it's not enough to use just definite state machines for string parsing, but that's a more complex stuff and uh, let's not focus on it. I, I, I'd say that 99% of practical tasks, definite state machines and regular expressions will solve uh, your task of uh, parsing strings. Don't use naive approaches. Don't use index of. Don't try to 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 uh, to reason about string uh, like you human do. Like let's read all the string. Let's find commas and see if uh, in its in vicinity of the comma if it's going to be a meaningful comma or meaningless comma. Don't do this. You have regular expression. You have definite state machines. Use them. Hope I'll just put this thought into you. <laughs> Okay, I think it's quite, uh, it was quite uh, difficult stuff. Uh, maybe any questions, comments on this? <laughs> uh, are people still alive? Yes, of course. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. But uh, yeah, programming, programming is difficult. <laughs> programming is difficult. Uh, definite state machines actually is uh, the most trivial way of uh, string parsing. There are more complex approaches that are actually used uh, in designing program languages. If you think about it, the program language itself, the like Java, Java, Java uh, file itself is uh, treated like string by a compiler. So it should be parsed in a way. And uh, it definitely uses uh, definite deterministic state machines to parse it, and then it uses other approaches to parse it and to, to uh, translate it into bytecode. Okay, all right. Uh, we have uh, we have fifteen minutes late, and uh, let's discuss roper types. In Java, we also have roper types for primitives, and it looks like this. Uh, let me show you. Let me show you. Uh, if you have, uh, say, int i equals 42, uh, it's a primitive type. You already know about it. What you might, what might be new for you is that you have integer j equals e, and you can write it like, like this. What's, what's the difference? The difference is that this type is primitive one, so uh, it's not an object. You cannot say i dot dot anything. There are no, no methods on it. 
these are not methods, these are shortcuts for IntelliJ idea. But if I press J dot, I can use compare to, I can use equals, I can use int value and I will get, uh, I will get int value, primitive value from this one. So this is sort of uh, just proper class. And if I, mm, well, let me just uh, show you on L LGV. Uh, let me just visualize uh, a new integer for you, like uh, new, oh, sorry, new integer 42. See, it's, uh, uh, it's track through, it's uh, not, it's prohibited actually, you don't use it in normal code, but uh, let me visualize what's going to be. Okay, come on, run. Oh, uh, it's it's an object, very simple object, which has one uh, one field inside it, and this field is primitive, so it's just holding this uh, forty two value for you. So it's this is why it's called dropper object. Like it's it's an object. It can be used in object oriented programming. It can be used in methods that uh, uh, expect object to be passed to them, but uh, it's robbed. Uh, actually, this is just robbed primitive value. So what do we have uh, uh, about them? Well, just a moment, let's get back to slides. Uh, they are, they remind us of uh, strings in a way because they are also, uh, they are also immutable objects. Once you created this integer, you cannot change its internal value. And uh, thus it should be uh, compared with equals and equals only. The same, the same things that we, uh, that I told you about uh, string, uh, the same for proper classes. So if you want to compare integers, you don't uh, you don't write it like this: integer a, integer b. If a equals uh, equals b, don't please never never ever use this because it won't work. You should write it like this: if a equals b for proper classes. And uh, <clears throat> Like strings in string pool, these objects are cached. So we also have internal cache of object like uh, on uh, this diagram. If we created the uh, roped object uh, from uh, some value of five, uh, this will be deduplicated in integer object pool, but not everything is going to be deduplicated uh, or cached. Uh, only values from a certain range uh, from minus 128 to 127. So uh, mm, integers, shorts, longs are only deduplicated in this range and byte uh, is deduplicated completely. This is why sometimes your equals equals will work for proper classes. Sometimes if it uh, falls into this range, if it's cached and it's deduplicated. It will work for you, but <laughs> generally it won't work. And this is why you should never use equals equals for comparing uh, proper classes in Java. I think it's uh, well, this must be clear now. Uh, all right. And uh, in Java, we also have a feature called auto boxing and not boxing. Why, why is it uh, introduced these uh, proper classes? Uh, I will tell about uh, generics and uh, collection API later, but uh, I think now you all, all, already know that we can just uh, have string integer, uh, a, a list of integer, say list equals to new array list, for example. And uh, what's wrong? Why it's not compiling? Should compile, remove type. What's this list? Ah, it's uh, the the incorrect list. Okay. Uh, uh, 
uh, we have a Java util list and it's a generic class and it expects uh, integer. So if I uh, press L dot add, see, as I declare this, uh, this list to be a list of integers, it uh, expects integer here as an argument of add. But I might as well print here 24 and it will work because under the hood, Java will auto box this value for, for me. So I'm just writing 24. And it, if I write here 24 in quotes, uh, then I'm doing what? I'm trying to put string to a list of integer. And Java tells me you are doing wrong. It's not going to compile. We expected integer you are putting string. So please don't. But uh, when I uh, put here integer uh, value of 42, then it's OK, because this is, uh, uh, this is the correct way to, to create an integer object. But if I just use uh, 42 here or 53, it's uh, also OK, because under the hood, Java will auto box this 53 value for me. See, if I change it from integer to string, Again, it won't compile because now it expects strings here, right? Like 53 as a string. So I, 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 I think it's, uh, it's clear for you, the, the, this trick about, uh, about types and why uh, we need a roper classes. Also, uh, uh, this was when we talk about integer value and uh, here, uh, this is called auto boxing because uh, under the hood, it will be converted to some integer value to some object. But there is also an unboxing. If we uh, still say, say let's uh, I'll get zero and uh, assign it to some variable, see uh, get equals uh, equal, uh, get yields us what type? The type that we defined here. So it's list of integers. So it's going to be integer here. Uh, but uh, if we just convert it to int, it will also work. And uh, what's done here by Java compiler is unboxing, automatic unboxing. So uh, in most of the cases, 53 or integer uh, value of 53 are transparent for you as programmers. So you can use int you can use integer, you can use, I don't know, float, you can use float with big F, you can use char, you can use character with big, big C. It's uh, the same, but internally it's not the same because these are primitives and they work way faster than objects because object, they, objects, they uh, allocate memory, they need to be garbage collector and, uh, and, and all stuff. Uh, this is why if you need, uh, say, a list of integer, and this list is going to be really huge, really huge, you will save time if you, you, uh, you will save not time, you will save memory and execution time, of course, and resources if you use uh, int, uh, integer array instead of this list. Uh, because int array is uh, going to be array of primitives and that will be way more performant. If you still uh, need uh, uh, some functionality of list, then you can uh, you can utilize some external libraries. Today we learned how to use external libraries in our code with Maven, uh, and these libraries provide uh, classes like uh, integer list. Say so what? Uh, what would the idea suggest? Add Maven dependency, or we have. Uh, but all them, all them are incorrect actually. So oh no, this is this is incorrect because we have uh, specific libraries uh, called uh, uh, Eclipse uh, collections or uh, what's going to be FastUtils, FastUtils library that provides things like uh, things like list of integers, so thing, uh, list of bytes, so. Uh, that it will allocate less memory because internally it will not wrap each and every integer into a proper object. Uh, okay, and uh, using these proper objects, we can also convert uh, a number to a string and a string to a number. It's quite easy. 
uh, if you have an integer int value, some int value, and you want to convert it to string, or you have a string and you want to convert it to int, uh, these classes are to help uh, because they have this parse parse method and two string methods. Uh, so they are use, used for, to convert to string and from string. And for big integer calculations, like when you want to calculate stuff on arbitrarily long integers, we have a nice class in standard library called big integer. So you can just uh, subtract, divide, uh, calculate power, or, uh, 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 all the stuff with arbitrarily large integer without loss of precision. And uh, big integer class also uh, helpful here. So this is uh, the theoretical part about robot classes. And I think there will be some questions on test about autoboxing and unboxing. All right, we have only five minutes left and uh, lots of stuff to cover about input and output. I think that uh, we're already <laughs> tired <laughs> with, with all the stuff that uh, I told you today. Uh, so maybe I should not start this, maybe just uh, in uh, high level overview, we have uh, streams, input and output streams in Java that allows us to read files and uh, read network. And uh, there is quite a um, quite big library of classes. So here, here are the complete zoo of IO classes. And here is this, uh, classes uh, separate zoo of classes for text input and output. And uh, you just need to maybe uh, read documentation on them and uh, start using in them because they are quite, uh, quite useful and quite handy to use. There are modern, uh, uh, modern IOs that I would like to show you. Uh, let, me, let me show uh, read, write, and text data. If you want, uh, if you want, uh, most often you need just to uh, read some text file into memory from uh, from file uh, from drive. So please refer to this slide, and you can use uh, this one liner to read uh, the whole file contents into a list of strings. So it's the modern way to to read files. The problem here is that. Uh, uh, Java API evolves, Java standard library evolves, and more and more uh, convenient stuff appears with years in Java. But uh, old tutorials that you might find on internet, old books, outdated books, they uh, often uh, show you uh, outdated ways to do stuff, which is uh, not, uh, not that clear, not that concise, not that performant. So uh, just now I just tell you that this is the most concise and performant way to, to, to read the uh, text file into memory uh, in modern uh, Java API. So please refer to this slide and, and use it. I will update the slide as, as long as I'm going to, to, uh, to read this uh, lecture course on Java. Uh, so it's actually one liner. And uh, <clears throat> there are uh, uh, also, there is an API called path API uh, that allow you to manipulate uh, files on the file system. So you can check if file exists, you can create file, you can remove files. So you can uh, work with a uh, file system using uh, path, uh, path uh, class. And it's uh, magic, actually it's uh, Java magic because uh, you can work on different uh, uh, operating systems on Mac, on Linux, on uh, Windows. And all this uh, path st uh, stuff will work. All this inputs, uh, file input stream, uh, stream will work for you, no matter which operating systems are you using or no matter what file system are you using because all, every file system is, here, is a hierarchy actually and path is an abstraction to, to use a file hierarchy. Uh, you can uh, use it more or less the same on each and every operating system. So this is it, but I uh, suggest that you read this, uh, uh, th these slides up to the end. And yeah, there is, a, oh, there is quite an interesting thing that I would like to ask you. Uh, and maybe, yes, let's, uh, let's use uh, the remaining couple of minutes uh, 
to understand this uh, very important concept, the concept of time, because Java has a dedicated API to work with time. And first I would ask, like to ask you, how many seconds are there in the day? Who is the first 30, one? So, so, uh, 36,800. And 800. Not each day has this number of seconds. Agree, no, no. agree. I agree. Yes, yes. I, <laughs> I know that every every year uh, we are celebrating it uh, like in a different. Every year it has different length length of time. <laughs> uh, and it's lead seconds as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so called uh, um, leap seconds, right? Because uh, uh, we have leap years, and sometimes we have leap seconds. So in a day, we have. Uh, that value of seconds or one more a leap second and actually we don't know because uh, it's uh, physicists that decide if we are going to introduce leap second uh, so uh, actually uh, this makes uh, working with the uh, date time api i api in a non trivial task and uh, actually uh, in every system in every operating system you have two two types of clocks let me just describe this and uh, then I'll, I'll let you go you just need to understand every operating system have has two types of clocks and in java we have two types of uh, system uh, functions that return time first one is uh, current time millis uh, that returns the number of milliseconds that have elapsed since uh, unix uh, uh, Unix time began, that's January 1st, 1917, minus the number of leap seconds in terms of system clock. So your system has this clock, it's 1414 my time, like, like uh, here locally in Moscow. And it's quartz clock. And it's uh, sometimes it's synchronized over internet, this clock. So I have access to this clock in Java uh, through system current time millis. Uh, but um, if I'm going to write software for Olympic games, for example, just imagine uh, people are running what just on, on skates or running 100 meter distance. And uh, you know that uh, it matters not only milliseconds, microseconds matter for, for Olympic champions. And uh, let's, uh, let's assume that we use this current time millis and uh, people started to run and the system decided to synchronize over internet. And we get one second to this point, another second to this side. And uh, so we won't be able to, uh, to validate the time interval using two, uh, uh, two calls to current time millis. So you must understand, when you are using current time millis, uh, you just cannot utilize it to measure the time difference between two events. Uh, if you are using it, it will be okay in most of the, ca in most of the cases, but uh, don't be surprised if uh, at some point you will see negative time intervals and you will see them because of NTP synchronizations, because of that uh, leap second stuff, because of, uh, I don't know, everything uh, related with this uh, system clocks, because this is not monotonic clock. So it's not monotonic time, it just leaps. And uh, yeah, it can jump in both directions. So uh, this is the thing you, you must always understand about current time leaps. Another type of clock that we have is so-called monotonic clock. And we have access to it uh, through a system nanotype. Nan uh, it has nanosecond accuracy, it is uh, very accurate by the way. And uh, it's guaranteed to be monotonic. So if you call system nanotime at one point, then call system nanotime at another point and just find the difference, you will find, you will always find the number of nanoseconds that passed between these two calls or, 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 or this system nanotime. But on the other side, this system nanotime clock has no reference to calendar time. It's just a number. It's just a random number uh, and uh, we have no guarantee that it, it means uh, something per se. So uh, when we are using this one, 
we're using it only to measure some time difference. So uh, this is a fundamental thing. It's a fundamental thing related to measuring time and on machines and each and every operating system in each and every language. And it's the same in Java. So there are two types of clocks. One of them is just system clock and another is monotonous clock. Okay, I think my time is over now. <laughs> so th thanks you for listening. Uh, we managed to record the, uh, to record this uh, session and I will publish it on YouTube so you can rewatch it and uh, see you next Tuesday on our final online lecture. <laughs>